this man has spent almost 16 years ignoring his children while trying to pursue a rap career. Not trying to pursue his GED, not trying to go to college. I put myself 90 hours through college raising three children on my own. I've always done hair. This man does nothing. I slept on the couch. I wouldn't even sleep in the bed with her. The reason why he ain't sleeping in the bed, he was never at home. He'll come home when it's time for me to go to work. How you gonna sleep in the bed and you too much in the streets? Because I didn't want to look in your face. I have been homeless because, because I can't of pay the child rent. Court. I my bills. 66 and a third percent of my check. And I can't pay rent. I can't do nothing. I don't have a life. And I have got the proof of my rares when I'm back owed. Can you believe it? She's never even chatted with him on the phone. Ms. Dennis spills the beans that she has never seen, spoken to, or heard the voice of the dude she thinks is her dad. This bombshell kicks off her epic quest to figure out who her real dad is. Buckle up, because it's about to get even crazier. But you have never seen him. You have never spoken to him. So today will be the very first day you will do that. And I wanted to make sure you were okay and you were prepared. All I've known of him is these pictures that I've had my entire life. These are pictures of my mother and him at their wedding. And so you've had these pictures, but you have not had your biological father. Not one bit. Hold the phone. Here's where it gets juicy. Judge Lake rolls out the red carpet with the case of Dennis versus Dennis, where Ms. Dennis is about to eyeball her supposed dad for the first time. The plot thickens as Mr. Dennis throws in a curveball, totally denying he's her biological dad. This drama is heating up and you'll want to see what's next. Miss Dennis, today will be the very first day you've ever laid eyes on the man you known to be your father. And I just want to make clear that you understand that Deny is your biological father. Jerome, at this time, I'd ask to please escort Mr. Dennis into the courtroom so we can begin the yes. proceedings. Wait till you hear this doozy. Mr. Dennis lays down his side of the story, blaming his wife's possible side adventures for his doubts about being the father. His tale is full of suspicions and unresolved drama it makes you want to grab some popcorn. And guess what? It's only going to dive deeper from here. My position here right now today is to give her closure, being the father or not being the father, which to me, I believe I'm not, because when me and her mother were married, I was a truck driver at the time. On Memorial Day weekend, I was down in Florida. I called her phone. She is out on the lake in the middle of the night by herself on an antique wooden boat with her ex-boyfriend. Check this out. In a plot twist, Mr. Dennis whips out evidence that he's been asking for a DNA test, which he claims James got shot down more times than he can count. This stack of paperwork adds a whole layer of frustration and legal shenanigans to his story. Hold on to your seats. The next part is a real kicker. I have requested from her mother, and I have proof for DNA test and everything else, that I have been denied by courts from her mother and everybody else. What is this, sir? That is proof of the DNA request that I have requested from the courts. But with her mother denying, I could not get a DNA test. I heard the story, the full story, finally when I was seven or eight years old. You're not going to believe what comes next. Over the phone, Ms. Morrell fires back against Mr. Dennis's cheating claims, insisting she was faithful during their marriage. Their stories clash like superheroes in a blockbuster, with each side dishing out their version of the past. As I recall this situation, it was not after we were married that I went on a boat with a friend, and my yes, children was. were there. Right. They, In fact, he let my daughter drive the boat. He's a good friend of mine. She was he dating was him at the time us... we met. Uh, Mr. Dennis, that you cheated with him. She is is Which a led to you story. becoming pregnant. This part is a tearjerker mixed with a facepalm. Mr. Dennis drops a bombshell that he's been slumming it because of the child support for a kid he's not even sure is his. This revelation really shows how messy things have gotten. And just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, there's more drama ahead. Mr. Dennis, you say you have been denied DNA tests that you've needed. Yes, ma'am, for, for 20 years. something years. I have been homeless because, because of, I can't of pay, the child pay my bills. 66 and a third percent of my check. And I can't pay rent. I can't do nothing. I don't have a life. And I have got the proof of my rares when I'm back owed. Grab a tissue for this one. Ms. Dennis gets real about how tough it's been growing up fatherless, questioning why her supposed dad never seemed to care. Her emotional unpacking is a gut punch of eels and unanswered questions. Just when you think it's all out on the table, there's a twist coming right up. For a child. My father travels across state lines, drives trucks, makes deliveries, and shows up for a living. But he can't do those things for me. I can understand. That's understand. what she's lived with for 20-something years. Mm -hmm. And I know you are being kind, and I know you are reserving a lot of your emotion because you're trying to be strong. Thank you. Here's the big reveal. Get ready to gasp. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Dennis, you are the father. 
Buckle up, Buttercup! The show kicks off with Ms. Nazarene throwing down the gauntlet at Mr. Rami, blaming him for bailing on dad duties and leaving her and their kiddos in a lurch. She's not holding back, accusing him of ghosting them emotionally and financially. Hang tight, because the tea is just starting to spill. Ms. Nazarene, uh, you are here today to sue your ex-boyfriend for being an absentee father and a deadbeat dad. You say he has caused you your two children much pain and suffering by never stepping up as their father. Mr. Rami claimed Ms. Nazarene has done immeasurable to your life and career by her very difficult personality. The gloves are off now. In a fiery exchange, Mr. Rami paints Ms. Nazarene as the queen of drama, irrational, volatile, and a nightmare to chat with. He insists her antics have made his life a roller coaster. But Ms. Nazarene claps back, calling out an incident where she claims Rami swiped $500. What's next? Oh, it's a doozy. Complete irrationality. The decision to be overtly angry, tile, and violent for things that I consider to be then important. Very verbally, physically abusive. Is that true, Ms. No, Nazarene? No, it's absolutely not true. He and I have had one incident where he stole $500 from me and had me and my baby in a car that had a steering column that failed. Just when you thought it was getting spicy, Ms. Nazarene lays into Mr. Rami for chasing dreams of rap stardom instead of job applications, all while she's been hustling through college and solo parenting their trio. Don't wander off. The fireworks are just getting started. This man has spent almost 16 years ignoring his children while trying to pursue a rap career. Not trying to pursue his GED. Not trying to go to college. I put myself 90 hours through college raising three children on my own. I've always done here. This man does nothing. The fact that we might have some children together and spend a short period of time enjoying each other's company. Plot twist. The judge jumps in to quiz Mr. Rami about his financial contributions, or the lack thereof. Rami admits he's not the most consistent with the checks, but claims he chips in when he can. Oh, snap. Wait till you hear what comes next. It's a real kicker. First of all, she decided to move to the other side of the country without talking to me. Well, it depends on what steady is. No, I haven't sent a every two weeks. No, I haven't. But when I've had a job, I have sent help. You Whenever have... she's hit me up for money, Everyone, if I was able yes, to... Yes, absolutely. $100. Yes, oh, absolutely. Over the past 17, 16 years, he paid child support when he was with um, ex second wife. Hold on to your popcorn. Ms. Nazarene drops a bombshell that Mr. Rami pulled a Houdini for three years while she was preggers and solo with a toddler. The crowd goes wild and the plot thickens. You won't believe what's up next. It's straight up soap opera stuff. Okay, so uh -oh. what, what happened to me being seven months in it with a one year old and you were gone for three years? <laughs> Truth be told. There was an incident. I was asked to bring the car to her because she had Messiah with her. Can you bring the car to Tarzan from Los Angeles? I tell her no problem. I would love to do that for you. Actually, what's funny is I'll tell you this story because it's more recent. You'll need to sit down for this one. As they sling text messages at each other like dodgeballs, the tension is palpable. The texts reveal a war of words that's nothing short of a daytime drama spectacle. The next exchange? It's a cliffhanger that'll have you rolling. I ain't damn playing. Not you trying to make me lose my youth because you're a deadbeat. I'm ready to smash you monsters. Your family does not care about us because we're too black skinned to be a big fat yellow hoe to get love and, I mean it. and care. And that's the truth. And I meant every one of them. Weren't they a young person? Did you say 21 years no, old? No, they were the not. The first grandchild. Reference. You might want to grab more snacks for this part. Judge Lake calls Mr. Rami out for his laid back attitude, which is not winning him any Dad of the Year awards. She doesn't mince words, calling him a loser in hopes of sparking some sense into him. The curtain's about to rise on the grand finale, and it's a showstopper. Wait, Mr. Making Rami, the will sure. you make that effort to see them tomorrow? Yes. yes. I Look, you're a writer, but don't write too it's on the text. Just yes, say, tomorrow. Just, and then if you could just give him a time, nothing else, and then you just say, I'll be there. And then I have my hat. be there. Can you do that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Buckle up for a wild ride. Miss Mitchell spills the beans about meeting Mr. Jordan way back when, at a courthouse at the tender age of seven. Mr. Jordan was there for a child support gig, claimed her as his kiddo, and started shelling out the cash. But, plot twist, he later flips the script and acts like she's a stranger. This scene is just setting the table for a saga filled with more twists and turns in a pretzel factory. At the defendant, Mr. Jordan, in a house when you were seven years old, you claim he denied paternity testing at that time and claimed you as his daughter and but since that time, he has denied used to treat you like his daughter. Grab your tissues, folks. This one's a heart tugger. Mrs. Mitchell's here today with a mission. Find out if Mr. Jordan really is the old man or just another dude from her mom's past. After losing her mom, she's got more holes in her life than a Swiss cheese, and she's hoping today's the day she starts filling them. The judge gets it, sharing her own tale of loss, bonding right there in the courtroom. Up next, we dive into Mr. Jordan's side of the story. And oh boy, brace yourselves. He is my biological father because I lost my mother a year ago 
from breast cancer. I want to fill that void. I don't have no one else. It's just me. Not knowing stepped up to the plate during that time, so I only imagine. Let's roll out the red carpet for Mr. Jordan's grand entrance. He dishes out the backstory of their first Corthusa drama, stepping up as the father figure without any DNA proof. Talk about a leap of faith. He even got all fatherly, prepping to adopt her and everything till mama pulled the plug. Hang tight, because Mr. Jordan's about to drop some truth bombs about his daddy. Doubts that'll have you raising your eyebrows. You know, and I found out about her. Hey, all I could do was step up. Saw her, this young lady in the courthouse. I sat down and spoke with her, and I immediately raised my hand and said, hey, that's, we don't need a paternity uh, test. I told her, I say, I'm your daddy, baby, right here. Hold on to your seats. We're diving deep now. Mr. Jordan confesses he's been on the fence about being daddy dearest since day one, thanks to a fleeting fling with Mrs. Mitchell's mom. Despite his suspicions, he tried to bond over brake pads. Yep, you heard that right. Car maintenance is father-daughter bonding. But when those brakes bailed the next day, things went south fast. Stick around to see how this mechanical mishap lays out in court. Blow me off every time. It was like every once or twice a year when he said, yeah. Something anymore. I was trying to teach her how to be self -sufficient. He stood there with me as I was doing my own break. I left, went to work the next day. My brakes came off on the freeway. Cue the flashback music because we're zipping back to when Mrs. Mitchell was just a seven-year-old in the courtroom. Mr. Jordan played the hero, volunteering to be her dad in front of a judge and all. But fast forward through the years and it's like he's got amnesia or something, completely bailing on the dad duties. What's next? Watch as Mrs. Mitchell brings out the big guns with some heavy-duty evidence. And a bitch, the judge asked me, do you know who your father is? I said, no. That's when he came up and said what he said about, that's when I was like, okay, well, you my dad. So I'm thinking, he about to start coming over, I'm about to be with him. I didn't see him for years. Even when my daughter passed away, he didn't call me. I didn't know she was pregnant. Things are getting real now. Mrs. Mitchell is not messing around, pulling out her birth certificate, which is as blank as Mr. Jordan's recent memories of fatherhood. She's laying it all out there, showing just how up in the air everything is about who her real dad might be. Don't go anywhere. The emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. I don't have his name. Nothing. So you're not listed on the birth certificate, sir. And also, sir. mother even doubted me. When I called trying to talk to her, why are you calling my house and that's not your father? But whenever she called me there to help her for whatever no, the reason. No, that's a lie. Oh boy, grab the popcorn because Mrs. Mitchell is reading a letter to Mr. Jordan that's so loaded with emotion it could burst. She's calling him out for missing an action all these years. And let me tell you, it's more dramatic than a soap opera. As she tears into him, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Next up, we've got a sister showdown that's going to crank up the heat even more. Even using that word brings up an image of pain. Lonely nights and years of, I never did anything to you for you to treat me the way you did over the year. There were times when I call you trying to fight in you and all you did was laugh like you're doing now. Ding, ding, ding. Here comes the sister fight you've been waiting for. Mrs. Mitchell and Miss Wagner, Mr. Jordan's confirmed daughter, go head to head, airing out all the dirty laundry. This isn't just a spat. It's a full-on sibling rivalry explosion with accusations and denials flying faster than a gossip at a hair salon. Keep watching because the DNA results are about to drop like a hot potato. Growing up, I'm the first one. So, okay. of course, of course you always first. I am the first one. We don't know nobody else. Don't Whatever. Girl, stop. Right here. All this crap. <laughs> no, thing. what you are She is fake. not like that. Whatever, you gonna whatever. do what I tell you to do because I'm whatever. a big No, no. no what you gonna tell me? What's interesting are you fighting just like sisters? And now, the moment of truth. Drum roll, please. Mr. Jordan, you are her father. Guess who just entered the chat? Miss Bronson, that's who? She's always seen Mr. Roberts as her dad, but bam. Now she's in court to confirm it because Mr. Roberts is starting to think maybe he's not the father after all. Miss Bronson, you have always known the defendant to be your biological father, but have opened your case against him to prove paternity because he now claims he has reason to deny he is your father. Hold the phone. Mr. Roberts thought all was well in fatherland until a few years ago when someone suggested he might not be the daddy. Enter Mr. Banks, who's also throwing his hat in the paternity ring. You believe Miss Bronson was your firstborn three years ago when your world was turned side down with the news that you may not be her biological father and that Mr. Bank claimed he is. Talk about drama. Miss Bronson is all kinds of upset because her supposed dad is now questioning if he really is her dad. She's adamant, though. Mr. Roberts is her pops, no ifs, ands, or buts. Your Honor, I feel Mr. Roberts is my father. He's the only father I've known for 29 years. That's my father. Period. I know him my whole life. He the only one I call my father. That's who I grew up known as my father. So Mr. Roberts is my biological father. That's it. So here's Mr. Roberts, right? He's been dishing out cash for Miss Bronson's whole life, even though his name's nowhere on her birth certificate. Talk about commitment. 
the times I was there and I was also on child support. Are you on her birth certificate? Oh, Your Honor, I'm not on her birth certificate. So, Miss Bronson, all your life, the man that you were told was your father, you believed father, and you had no reason to doubt it. Yes, Your Honor, up until 2009. So, back in 2009, Miss Bronson's mom drops a bombshell over the phone, mentioning Mr. Banks and hinting he might be her real dad. Imagine that call, hey, honey, remember that guy I said might be your dad? Like, what? What happened in 2009? I had a phone conversation with my mother, then she mentioned Mr. Banks, and she said, don't you remember the guy that I told you thought he was your father? When she said that to me, Your Honor, it was a what moment, like, what are you talking about? She said that he wanted to get in contact with me. I gave her my number to give to him, or she gave me, I can't remember how we actually got in contact, and then I, we reached out to one another. Did you know Mr. Banks? You know who he was? No, Your Honor. Imagine chilling out and your fiance comes up and says, babe, we need to talk. You might not be Miss Bronson's dad. Mr. Roberts probably needed a stiff drink after that chat. Hang tight. It's about to get even wilder. A few years ago, Miss Blair told me that she needed to talk to me about something, and that's when I found out. I was kept in the dark about all this. I never knew anything about Mr. Banks. I also, you know, spent eight months in jail for unpaid child support. $75,000 in the rear. You didn't get a call. Your fiance comes to you and says... Possibility but... that Jasmine is not my biological daughter. Here comes Mr. Banks with a story about a park meetup ages ago, where Miss Bronson's mom hinted that he could be the daddy. And all this based on a family resemblance. Family reunions must be fun with these guys. When did you become aware that you potentially could be Miss Bronson's biological father? I can recall uh, when she was about six or seven, and I ran to her mother, Jasmine, and her sister in the park. Then they, uh, she had told me that Jasmine, my daughter then. Oh, do you remember the word she used? No, I don't. She, I just recall her saying that Jasmine was my daughter. This whole time, poor Mr. Roberts was out of the loop about these paternity whispers. Then Mr. Banks strolls back into the picture, stirring up all sorts of family drama. I knew nothing of Mr. Banks. I dated Miss Bronson. I even married her two months after Jasmine born, and I went on my business as raising as the start of my family. But possibility, if I'd known that earlier, it probably wouldn't have been. I would have discontinued that relationship. And I look at it like this, as being young, I would have been like, well, I dodged the bullet. I did the best, and I took responsibility. Mr. Roberts is feeling all the feels, upset about being the last to know he might not be the dad. He's wondering why no one bothered to clue him in sooner. Talk about feeling left out of the loop. Yeah, because we've been on vacation, birthdays, you know, we she came down Merlin lived, lived with us for eight years and now you know she got her first apartment which we live in this complex I live in been and she live in around the corner so taking to school her, her children taking them out my we still involved in each other life to this day but we here to find out if I'm her biological part of Mr. Banks okay everyone here it comes the DNA results are in and guess what it has been determined by this court Mr. Robert you are not the father She's still my daughter. I love you. You're always going to be my daughter. Here we go, folks. Mr. Redmond is introduced. He asserts that he owes over $10,000 in child support for two daughters, Laquandria and Keisha Redmond, whom he claims are not his. This sets the stage for the court case, highlighting the central conflict over paternity and financial responsibility. Mr. Redmond, you currently owe more than $1,000 in child support for the defendant's two teenage daughters, Laquandria Redmond and Kaisha Redmond, who you say are not yours. Ms. Patterson, you say you are 100% certain that both girls are his daughters and you cannot wait to prove the truth. Get a load of this. Mr. Redmond talks about his time in the slammer because of the child support debacle, emphasizing the hefty consequences he's faced. He whips out some paperwork to show Judge Lake, proving the mountain of cash he owes and dives into the legal muddles that have turned his life upside down. But hang on, the soap opera's just getting started. Over 19 years, I've been taking care of these kids. Your Honor, I've been going to jail and I know for a fact that these kids aren't mine. I've gone to jail because I owe more than ten thousand dollars. What is that, sir? This is a some from the courts where I owe over ten thousand dollars in child support. Paper. Let me see that paperwork, Troy. You all are married. No, ma'am. You're not married. Divorce. Divorce now. You're not gonna believe this bit. Marshall steps up with some juicy evidence that hints at Ms. Patterson's possible infidelity. This includes a rather compromising scenario with Ms. Patterson and another dude, which Mr. Redmond caught with his own eyes, fueling his doubts about being the daddy. Buckle up because it's about to get even juicier. Your Honor, as you can plainly see, her and her friend was in the bathroom and he had his pants down. That what? is a lie. To the bathroom, Your Honor, his pants was down and he quickly tried to pull them up. What? Yes, Your Honor. You all were dating? Yes, Your Honor. You're saying that's not true? That's not true. Oh boy, here's a twist. Mr. Marshall spills the beans about catching Miss Patterson in bed with another man at her workplace. This bombshell adds a whole new level of drama and complicates the story about Miss Patterson's loyalty. You'll want to stick around because the next part is a doozy. What is this? I went to Miss Patterson's workplace, but at this point in time, I had her 
job. The front people told me where she was at, how to find her location. I went back there, find the location that they told me to go. Miss Patterson in the bed with another man oh, on top of the man. Really? So this is you observing? Yes, ma'am. Guess what's next? The spotlight swings to Kashia as Mr. Redman questions if he's really her pops too. He describes how frosty things got at home, including opting for the couch instead of the bed, which he reckons supports his claim of not being the father. Just when you think it can't get more tangled. I was so furious with Miss Patterson when we left her hometown. I slept on the couch. I wouldn't even sleep in the bed with her. The reason why he ain't sleeping in the bed, he was never at home. He'll come home when it's time for me to go to work. How you gonna sleep in the bed and you too much in the streets? Because I didn't want to look in your face. <laughs> Now, this is heart-wrenching, but kinda sweet. Kayashia and Lequandria Redmond step into the courtroom, sharing their feelings about Mr. Redmond, who they've been told is their father all along. Their emotional accounts shed light on how this paternity mess has affected them personally and how they feel about Mr. Redmond's dad skills, or lack thereof. But don't go anywhere. The emotional roller coaster is about to hit a big drop. Even as children, you all don't remember when I was always taken to go to his mother's house, because he did have a house. He's always in and out of my life. He's never done anything for me. And that hurts you. I mean, it did, but then I had to realize again that has it hurt you? When we was homeless and we had nothing, we called him and he never gave us nothing as for money or anything. And now, a moment of truth. Drum roll, please. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Redmond, you are the father. <laughs> we both look alike. All right, strap in, folks. The court kicks off with Mr. Poravecchio tossing a bombshell right out the gate. He's accusing Ms. Touche and her daughter, Ms. Lutz, of pocketing a cool $150,000 from his dad's death settlement by pretending Ms. Lutz is his sassist. He's pretty sure she's not, and that Ms. Touche has been playing the long con to snag that inheritance. Let's see how this wild ride unfolds. Mr. Poravecchio, you claim that the defendants, Ms. Touche and her daughter, Ms. Lutz, fraudulently received $150,000 in settlement money from the death of your father, Ricky Poravecchio Sr. Cause Miss Lutz is not your biological sister and her mother covered up that fact. Hold on to your popcorn. Mr. Poravecchio dives deeper into the soap opera that is his family's drama. He details how his dad met his watery end while working on a tugboat and how it was all written off as an accident. But there's a twist. He's not buying the whole happy family picture and insists on a DNA test to prove his point. Buckle up because there's more juicy drama ahead. Mr. Poravecchio, how have you and your family been defrauded frauded by the defendant. My father was on a tugboat working and he drowned. Accidental debt is what it said on his death certificate. You're not gonna believe this part. The courtroom turns into a daytime drama as they hash out Ms. Lutz's real last name. Born Thiel but later switched to Poravecchio to cash in on some sweet social security benefits. The plot thickens with family secrets spilling out. This inheritance tangle is just getting good, folks. I have evidence right here on a birth certificate. You submitted this birth certificate because you originally she was named, Ms. Lutz was named Thiel. And then then later on, her last name was changed to Provecchia. You felt like she in some way affect settlement distribution? Correct, Tell Your Honor. Me. A week after my, my dad was declared deceased, Miss Lutz was named changed from Field. Oh boy, grab your tissues or your giggles. Family members are really laying it on thick, sharing sob stories and pointing fingers about who did what at family picnics. Miss Lutz pulls at the heartstrings, talking about her daddy issues and trying to reclaim her Poravecchio status. But don't wander off. The blame game is about to hit overtime. Because I have never heard that I was not a poor Vecchio. I got into never, it on Facebook. I've he never actually met my mom at Mardi Gras and begged her to let us in, let us back in her life. Yes, I did. And then when we were at a restaurant celebrating my brother's birthday after being in contact for a year with her parents. Do you remember that? Yes. And I remember it very clearly. She made my brother, my brother it's cry. Right. Can it get any spicier? Yep. Now they're throwing around accusations of Ms. Tache stepping out on Mr. Poravecchio Sr. with some mystery man. She's all denials and eye rolls, swearing it's all a big misunderstanding. This family feud is serving up more twists than a pretzel factory, and trust me, you don't want to miss what's next. When Ricky and I first met, I was uh, somewhere around 16 years old. I mean, we just immediately, he's a handsome, good-looking Italian man. I just couldn't help myself. I fell in love, and it was just him and I, just us together. Things were great. I got pregnant. I was almost 18 years old because he started showing signs of jealousy, issues going on. We got past that. Here it comes, the moment of truth. The DNA results are in, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. Porvecchio and Ms. Lutz are siblings. Thank I you. Keep up, Ricky. Keep it up. You run.